Here lately, I've been diving deeper and deeper into some of my NASCAR history videos, but today, I find myself down in a rabbit hole of darker NASCAR history that I did not know about until recently. Richard Petty is the king of NASCAR, achieving heights that nobody will probably ever catch in the modern era, including 200 career wins in NASCAR's top series, and being one of only three to win seven championships. He spent the majority of his time racing with the Chrysler Motor Company, both in Dodge and Plymouth race cars. In the early 1960s, nobody could touch them, especially with Petty's team providing feedback to Chrysler. In 1964, Dodge and Plymouth got a total of 26 wins, 9 of which were from Petty, and that came after 1963 having 19 wins by Plymouth drivers, and 14 of those were from Richard Petty. A lot of this had to do with the Hemi engine that Chrysler used back then, and it got to the point where Ford and the General Motor Company, GMC, had just had enough of it, and they were actually threatening to leave NASCAR if the Hemi motor was not banned. While Petty was not the only one utilizing the Hemi, they were the key team who had figured it out the best, and NASCAR was left with two choices going into 1965. Ban the Hemi, forcing Petty and Chrysler to get a new engine package, or lose their other two OEM partners. Obviously, from a business perspective, you can understand which option they chose and why they chose it. NASCAR made the decision to ban the Hemi that was powering Chrysler's Plymouth, and rather than succumbing to NASCAR's ultimatum of change engine or change manufacturer, Richard Petty chose option C, take your ball, or Hemi engine, and go home, or rather, go drag racing. The plan for 1965 was for Richard Petty and Chrysler to boycott the 1965 NASCAR season altogether, and with the blessings and support from Chrysler, Petty became a drag racer in 1965. Now, it's nothing unusual for drivers to try other disciplines of racing today. We've seen Jimmy Johnson transition from NASCAR to IndyCar and sports car racing. There have been IndyCar and F1 superstars transition over to stock car racing. And then, of course, dirt track racing seems to translate so well into NASCAR, like with Kyle Larson. But drag racing and stock car racing are two very different forms of racing. But it's not unheard of either. We've seen an NHRA superstar in Ron Capps try his hand at dirt track racing. Tanner Gray has also transitioned from drag racing in the Pro Stock Division to racing in a NASCAR Camping World Truck Series. And one of the more notable modern crossovers was Kurt Busch giving it a go in Pro Stock Drag Racing back in 2011. But for this period of time, and for Richard Petty, who was no doubt becoming the face of NASCAR racing still well into the prime years of his career, this was a major deal, and NASCAR had to have felt like this was a slap in the face. Before the 1965 season, NASCAR would be without one of their best racers and families for that matter, with the Petty family of course being dominant since the sports inception of Lee Petty. Needless to say, the media at this time ate this story up. Nevertheless, in 1965, Petty Enterprises and Chrysler were preparing a new kind of race car for Richard Petty, a Petty Blue painted Plymouth Barracuda with the number 43 JR. However, shortly into Petty's time in drag racing, things became very dark rather quickly. On February 28, 1965, Richard Petty experienced one of the worst days of his racing career competing at the Southern Dragway near Atlanta, Georgia. Petty lined his Barracuda up next to Illinois drag racer Arnie Beswick, and when the lights went off, both drivers took off as they always would, but as Petty was changing from first to second gear in his run, something broke in the front left side of his car. The result of this caused the car's steering and braking system to become compromised, and Petty was losing control. His car started to veer to the left, and attempting to get it back on the track, Petty steered to the right, but the car veered too far to the right and was headed straight into a crowd of fans standing on a dirt embankment with a wire fence. The car managed to jump the embankment and slam into the wire fence that was about as tall as to an average person's neck, sending debris, even as large as one of the tires, into the crowd of onlookers. The safety crews responded to the crash, and while Petty was okay, the results were unfortunately clear that spectators were harmed. Seven fans were injured, and unfortunately, an eight-year-old boy, Wayne Dye, who was standing with his father watching the races that day, was dead as a result of injuries from the debris. It's no secret that racing is a dangerous sport, both as a driver, crew member, and a fan, but it doesn't make situations like this any less difficult to deal with. One could possibly compare this incident to Talladega in 2009 when Carl Edwards' car hit the catch fence, sending debris into the crowd that did result in minor injuries, but this, it takes that to a whole other level. According to Richard Petty's wife, Linda, in the 2010 documentary Petty Blue, this accident very nearly took Petty's joy out of racing entirely, but especially drag racing. She said that when he arrived home from that race, he just needed time to be left alone and sit outside to reflect on what exactly had just happened. 
His heart was just no longer in drag racing. As bad as he felt about this, it did not take away from any hard feelings from the family of Wayne Dye, who sued the track operators Petty Enterprises and the Chrysler Company. I can personally understand why they'd sue the ones they did. What was originally just a nice day at the races had resulted in an incident where a Petty Enterprise prepared Chrysler car, which was trusted to be safe, had broke free at the Southern Dragway, resulting in the loss of such a young life, and the family would never be the same. I mean, what would you do if you were to die's family shoes? It's hard to say I'd do anything different. The lawsuit did not go real far as Petty and Chrysler were able to settle out of court with the Dye family, and according to all sources out there, the Petty family never heard from the Dye family again after reportedly paying the Dye family more money than the Trek would make that entire year. Ironically, Daniel Dye has since been developing in the lower series for the Petty GMS Alliance, but he is of no relation to this Dye family. While this situation was enough for Petty's heart to no longer be in drag racing, he and Petty Enterprises still had a job to do at Chrysler. So he did drag race again after this, but things were just not the same after that. After time questioning things and having to come to terms with what had happened, this would eventually lead to Richard Petty's retirement from drag racing almost as quickly as his time started, and Richard Petty and Chrysler would eventually settle up with NASCAR, coming back midway for the 1965 season, competing in 14 races, scoring 10 top fives, and 4 victories in the short season he had. After that, Petty's career in NASCAR would continue to proceed how we know it today as the king of NASCAR, but if you ask him about his time in drag racing, well, it's quite possible that this almost ended his entire career with the guilt he felt immediately after. So with that, I pose the question to you. What are your thoughts? Was Petty and Chrysler in a wrong for the car breaking? Was the settlement the right decision to make in this? And do you think things would have gone different for Petty in 1965 or even further had this accident never occurred? Could Richard Petty have went on to be as good as John Force in drag racing? Let me know what you think down in the comments section. Apologies for more of a sad video this week, but myself, I really had not heard about this moment until recently. Another thing to debate is, had Ford and GMC never hammered down on NASCAR so bad, would this moment have ever happened? And another thing one could debate is the differences in this situation versus the Tony Stewart, Kevin Ward Jr. situation in which the Ward family unsuccessfully sued Tony Stewart. There's so much debate that can be had about situations like this, but the sad reality is that no matter what is debated, said, or blame thrown on, it can never bring back the life of young Wayne Dye. Until next time, thanks for watching today's video, and if you enjoyed it, be sure to click the like button, and be sure to subscribe to DanyB Talks and click the notification bell so you get alerts when I post next. Until next time, this is Danny B. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Bye, guys. Hey, race fans. Thanks for watching this video from Danny B Talks. If you're new to my channel, please be sure to hit subscribe and click the notification bell so you never miss another video from my channel.